All right, cool. Yep. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. September uh, community events. Uh, here's our agenda. So as usual, pro uh, the project community stats update, the uh, product roadmap, and then we'll have data assistance with James, and then we'll wrap up with questions. So we'll give plenty of time for for Q and A uh, after James's presentation. Uh, so we're hiring. Uh, check out jobs.superconductive.com. Um, you'll see there's a few cool positions here. Uh, would love to get somebody from the community to join us. Uh, I, yeah, you get to hang out with us. You get to build great expectations. Okay, cool. Uh, so here's some of uh, the uh, project community stats. So since we last met, we've added 582 people to Slack. We crossed the 8,000 mark, which was the uh, top line last time we were here, and now we're chasing that that 10K, uh, which is exciting. And I think we are on the fringe of 8K on GitHub Stars too. So it's a cool, cool update. Uh, we sort of hit our level here on the uh, PyPy download. So we had this big, big spike in the fall. We sort of hit found our new our new floor coming into uh, the, through the second half of of, of this year. Um, all right, so my favorite part, some thanks and kudos to the community members. Uh, this goes to the people who are helping at Slack this month and the people who have made recent contributions. Um, some of our top Slack supporters, these are all people who have helped somebody in Slack. Uh, it is it is an order. So we have two, two new names on here that we haven't seen, uh, Kirill and Atai. Thanks so much for recently, but the past month. You've done a ton in helping out, along with you know asking your own your own questions. So I appreciate you know giving giving back while you're getting support uh, from the community yourself. Um, so yeah, so thanks everyone here uh, who've made contributions. Bogdan, Steven, oh, and, and Atai also has a, a docs contribution. Uh, Ty Russell for uh, the better better error for missing expectations, uh, and then we have a few other people. Uh, who've made great contributions to the project. So thanks so much. Uh, it's the bigger the bigger we get, the more important it is to have support in Slack because uh, it's it just gets harder and harder to keep up. Uh, so thanks so much for everyone who's who's contributed to the uh, our open source project. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Don for the uh, product roadmap. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Uh, so our roadmap is guided by wanting to make great expectations powerful and expressive. Uh, after years of development and widespread adoption, the core APIs are robust, stable, and thoroughly tested, and it's easy to get started. So we wanted to be able to make this claim boldly and honestly, and our investments that in the product are really around being able to support different dimensions of this. Uh, the, the launch today is really going to be focused on making it easier to get started. Uh, so next slide. So launches, the onboarding assistant and data assistants in general are, are launching today which is uh, super exciting. And James is here to give a, a demo about that right after this. Um, and what's in a launch? I've been working with uh, members of the community uh, to get feedback on the new future features, uh, get, get testing and stuff. Tal has been instrumental in pulling together the folks for that. Um, we've made a lot of documentation updates, including to the guides and tutorials. Uh, significantly for the onboarding assistant, we replaced the user configurable profiler in the getting started tutorial. And then, happening now and and over the next uh short while will be announcements in slack our blog and other channels such as this community meetup meeting so uh, that's what's going on now and next up is uh really looking at making investments in our developer or user experience um improvements around the data context making it easier to get a data context having the methods better documented and stuff data context is really at the heart of great expectations and so everything that we can do there has this big effect on the usability and approachability of the whole platform. And then the other one is uh, improvements to data sources. So, uh, you know, the idea of being able to connect to a source within one to two lines of code, which uh, right now is this YAML based guided experience. So looking to dramatically simplify that, make it easy to get started both within a Python file, like an IDE editor or a notebook without having to context switch between the CLI and progress smoothly to being able to find assets with multiple batches, which uh, the data assistant will really showcase, uh, but can be tricky to get defined right, right now, um, often with only looking at configure doc support. And so how do we build an API that allows 
uh, you to go from, hey, I've got my table, okay, now how do I want to break it up into the chunks of data that I care about? Um, we're also adding better nating and metadata for batches, which will make batch metrics more addressable. And so there's kind of two uh, motivating factors here for improvements to data sources. One is uh, making it easier to get started and use great expectations, but the other is uh, to make the batches more addressable so that um, to support future work in batch metrics and, and making it easier to reason about data over time. So if you'd like to be part of this journey, again, Tal is going to be uh, soliciting your feedback. We're, we're looking to get the first two of these developed, get some um, uh, en engaged communities getting feedback on what we initially release, and then iterate collaboratively with you as we launch out support for more and more data sources in this new style. And that's it. Over to James. Thank you so much. Um, I am super excited to get to be here. I'm, yeah, I'm going to steal the uh, screen share. And um, yeah, right at it. Data assistance. Um, so this uh, this this talk and this chance to launch a feature represents a tremendous amount of work from this whole team. And uh, so it's really fun for me to get to be the voice of it, but I want to be clear that it's not just um, you know the superconductive great expectations team, but really the fact that we have a community of people using the product that makes this this whole endeavor possible. So thank you very much for being here. I haven't gotten to come to the last couple of community meetups. So it's really exciting for me to get to see people uh, engaged. And I want to encourage you to ask questions um, at, at the at the end of this talk and, and about the feature in general as well, continue to engage in, in Slack. Um, I want to organize our agenda today around uh, an important theme for data assistance, which is questions. So we're going to walk through, and uh, as I move through the talk, we're just going to answer a few different questions. The first one is, why did we make data assistance? And the answer is that there are a lot of people who we interact with who get started using great expectations with an experience that is something very much like this. You know, the dashboard broke. They know we know, we all know, we need to be using an expectation-based approach to really be proactive when it comes to data quality. But it can be daunting to actually get started. I, I'd call it the pale blue dot problem. Um, I love this quote from Carl Sagan. And hey, the reason- hey, um, Yeah. Super quick, we're seeing your uh, notebook right now. Actually, we're not seeing the slides. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you very much. And let me update that share. How about now? We've got the slides. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're, you know, you're jumping ahead uh, too far, too far into this talk. Um, thank you so much, uh, Don. Let me re review. We've got an agenda. The agenda is organized. Um, around a number of different questions. First, why did we make data assistance? And I mentioned this kind of common scenario that people know they need to get started with expectations, but they face the pale blue dot problem. Um, the problem that the universe is huge and it can be extremely intimidating and difficult to know where to get started. I, you know, I love the perspective that Carl Sagan is giving us in this quote. And I think that sometimes when you're beginning the data quality journey, um, or really beginning to interact with uh, any new data set and certainly a large collection of new data sets, it can be difficult to get oriented and know uh, what is the, the way to, to make your first expectation. Um, it's tricky to know what expectations are available. And we have this fantastic gallery, the link here that I would encourage you to go visit and you'll see a huge number of expectations, um, many of which have been contributed by community members. But when you have that big list, it can be difficult again to figure out which are the first ones that you wanna put in place for a particular data asset. And when you're working with a new data set, there's always this question that is the uh, classic question of exploratory data analysis. What does my data look like? With all of these, the fundamental goal that we have in data quality problems or projects is to get ahead of that break. So that instead of reacting to a data quality problem, 
when you get a call from somebody else in the organization, you can identify it and fix the problem proactively. So with data assistance, we're proposing an answer guided by the, the adage that the best way to start eating or to eat an elephant is one bite at this time. Um, we're just gonna get you started with great expectations with data assistance. So the, the, the reason to use data assistance is to help get started interacting with data, uh, new data sets or with great expectations. Next question, what exactly is a data assistant? You can think of a data assistant like a partner who asks questions about your data, uh, gathers metrics about what is observed in the data, and then proposes expectations to you based on the answers. So your data assistant will uh, issue a number of queries. And then the great thing about data assistants is they really love showing you what they've found. So a data assistant will produce uh, charts, that describe what has been observed, and then also propose expectations and show you what uh, the assistant thinks would be potentially useful expectations based on previous data. And I'll get into uh, what these charts are a little bit more in the demo. Next question, how do data assistants work? Well, I mentioned the theme uh, of this conversation is all about questions. And Data assistants work by wrapping up functionality from rule-based profilers. So they include a collection of prepackaged rules that have uh, parameters that you can tune and adjust if you'd like to, uh, but they guide the profiler or the assistant to uh, explore certain paths and ask a number of different questions. So you know the questions might be things like, what columns does the data have? Uh, how much data is there in each batch? Are values in some column unique? Um, are there a lot of null values? And by asking all of these questions and then compiling together the metrics, the data assistant can provide you with a, uh, a comprehensive but very semantically grounded picture of your data. For the assistant that I want to talk about today, the assistant that we're launching, we call it the onboarding assistant. And I alluded to why that is, which is it's a way to just get going with great expectations. These are the questions that the onboarding assistant will ask when it's exploring your data set. So I mentioned some of the ones at the top, but there's also this branching behavior where the assistant can ask a question like, what kind of column is this? And then based on the answer, ask different kinds of questions that are tuned to an understanding of that kind of data. And then going a step further, it can add expectations based on the answers to each of those questions. So when we ask what columns are present in the data, we can create an expectation that those columns be present in the future. When we ask questions about the standard descriptive statistics of a numeric column, we can create expectations about each of those statistics. And doing that allows you to create a rapid profile with a lot of insight about the data. So in this chart, we're looking at a particular uh, metric, the quantile values. And in particular, we're, we see three lines representing the 25th, 50th, and 75th uh, percentile of values in a column that's called fair amount. I'll talk about this data set in more depth in a moment. Along the x-axis, you'll see there are 12 different batches. And that's really important. For each of those observations, we're looking at a different batch of data that's of the same type that you'll be validating when you're using great expectations in your pipeline. The y-axis is the value of the metric that's been observed. So in this case, um, the, the 50th percentile value hovers somewhere between eight and 10 and so forth as you read the chart. And I mentioned this earlier, but what's really impressive about data assistance is that they can then help you proactively establish expectations by proposing an expectation suite that's built using the metrics that have been observed from all of your previous data that you'd like to, to, to look at. So in this case, we're proposing the expectation, expect column quantile values to be between. And that expectation is um, being parameterized with those three different quantile values that I described. And each one has a different range representing the range of values that have been observed in the past. 
All right. Now we're getting into some of the more exciting questions. How do I use data assistance today? Well, I think there are sort of two primary use cases that I want to highlight. And each one has a, a flag um, associated with it. One really uh, important case is where you're building a profile of data that's already been processed or normalized, where you're very, very confident that this is sort of gold standard data. It represents what you think your data should look like. It's a great way to help you launch a data project more quickly. Uh, we call that estimation method exact. If you use the exact estimation method, you're not going to get any failed expectations when the uh, validation runs on the same data. Um, but if the data changes, you will start seeing failures. Uh, and that's exactly the case that it's designed to work with. Now, in almost every case that I've experienced, subject matter experts are absolutely central to the process of building an effective data quality system. And you're going to need to work closely with subject matter, matter experts to adjust the expectations. So um, these data assistants love to ask questions. And they'll ask lots of them. And you may get more expectations in some cases than you actually would want to use in your uh, ongoing pipeline. Um, the next use case that I think is really important is when you're working with new data or data that isn't yet fully processed, where you think there may still be data quality uh, issues present in the data. It's great for kind of bootstrapping your process of getting started, you know, building an exploratory analysis of a data set that you don't yet fully understand, um, and then progressively building the pipeline to make it useful for the case that you're going to be working with. The estimation method for this mode is called flag outliers because that's exactly what it does. It looks for outliers in the data set, flags those, and will immediately produce expectation suites that fail uh, on the exact same data that it was fed with because it will um, be flagging those outliers. Obviously, before um, an expectation suite that was generated in that way will pass validation, you should expect to process the data more, right? Like that's why we, uh, you'd be working with that mode. There are a few key knobs available to you to uh, get started. I mentioned this primary one, the estimation method, but there's a few other things that uh, you should definitely be aware of when you're working with an assistant. The first is this question, of course, of which batches you feed the assistant for looking at and evaluating. Um, I mentioned before that you can use multiple batches. That's really an a important and powerful feat part of data assistance. In fact, I think that's what I would say is the primary reason that we're moving from the previous user configurable profiler methods over to these data assistants. They're multi-batch aware from the very beginning. The second thing that is really common is just specifying columns to include or exclude. And that's very simple. You can do it right in the, the command when you're running the data assistant. And it can help you really limit the scope of the questions that are being asked. And it's a great way to tune performance of the data assistants. Finally, you can adjust individual rules. Um, an example for this is that the uh, standard onboarding data assistant will use a variety of text regular expressions to match whenever it sees a text column. Uh, that can be a relatively expensive computing operation if you already know things like what the standard uh, kinds of values in a text column should be, or alternatively, if you know that there isn't a, a standard way that you'd like to model those, you can just tell the data assistant when it's getting started so it doesn't need to go down that path. Now, did I mention that data assistants really, really, really like to ask questions? Um, as a result of that, there are some things that I would just kind of caution you to be watching out for uh, when you get started. First is, um, I'd recommend that you sample your data. Uh, the re main reason is so that you don't throttle the underlying data uh, warehouse or um, compute engine that you're working in. Uh, often a small sample of data, especially if you could fully randomize the sample, will give you a great starting point for understanding the data set. Um, and you can configure an additional asset in your data source that represents that sample data. I'll use that pattern in the demo today so you can see what I mean. The next thing to watch out for is that latency in your data source will really affect performance. Uh, 
And the reason is that we're issuing lots of queries. And of course, there is some work we do to batch those together. But because of the branching logic, um, there is a, a, a definite kind of increase in performance time when you, um, when you have a high latency connection to the underlying data source. I'll run this demo in a local environment. You won't see a, a significant uh, impact of that. Um, the next thing is something that I think is, is uh, important to note because it really just is a big part of the ethos of great expectations and the way that we approach facilitating communication and collaboration between people, which is we're very explicit in all the things that you do, right? Every expectation name is very long and descriptive. And I think it's really the same underlying motivation that leads to the fact that we use very simple estimators. Um, for example, if you have a date column, the data assistant will propose an expectation that has a maximum value. Um, we don't estimate trend lines, we're, we're boxing. Now, we can change those things and you can change those things in rules, but the primary reason that we wanted to build this way is to have a very modular design and to pro provide something that builds again on that ethos of um, extremely explicit descriptions of the data. Um, now, Don actually alluded to this last thing um, just a moment ago in terms of being able to configure data sources in one to two lines. Uh, when you see the code snippets, and I would like definitely encourage you to take advantage of the at tal opportunity to engage early. Uh, it'll, it'll be really, I think, really impressive. I love it. I can't wait to be using it all the time when I'm configuring data sources. Um, so watch out for that because again, being able to use a multi-batch uh, asset is really an important part of this workflow. All right, last question. Can you show me this? Uh, so let's take a look into a notebook. Um, the data set that I'm going to use uh, is actually from the New York City taxi data. Um, I decided recently, by the way, that we use this data set enough that I, I needed to take a little bit of a field trip to New York. So um, on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a picture of a receipt from a cab ride that I took in New York not that long ago. Um, I picked a few different data fields, the, the trip distance, the, the value of the tips, uh, the total amount of the charge. And you know, sure enough, I was able to find this trip in the data set. Um, now, I, I already just can't resist pointing out that if you look at the paper receipt, the timestamps don't quite match. Um, and I happen to know that there were two people in that cab, even though passenger count is one. So, you know, data quality issues, they're never going to go away. Uh, but this is a really, really cool data set. Um, what it is, is that every month, each of the, um, the, every time anybody takes a cab ride in New York City, um, it's entered into this database and published on a monthly basis. You can get it uh, easily from Amazon, from Azure, or directly from the city of New York. And um, let's switch over to a notebook where we'll explore this data set. Um, to get started, uh, I'm gonna import pandas. And I mentioned um, in case, I'll just leave this available. If you wanna just only download just yellow because there's a few different kinds of taxi data and just for, for the last couple of years, you could use this command to just download the data, bring it down locally and, and you could be able to run this demo. Now I mentioned sampling data, it's really important, really simple with pandas. So I'll just write this function here to downsample Parquet files. Uh, the data is published as Parquet, so it's nice, it has a schema embedded, that's a relatively recent change. Um, and we'll just go through the data for 2021, 2022, and we're gonna take a 10% uh, a sample of the data. Um, I'm just fixing the random state so that uh, you know, we'll know we'll get the same sample uh, every time. So uh, I've got this data now processed into my sample directory, and I'm going to switch over to using great expectations. So we'll import great expectations. Uh, check we're running 01524. That's the newest release just came out uh, in the last couple of days. Um, I'm going to load up my data context, and I want to just show you the data source configuration that we're using because I mentioned it's very important to be able to have these multi-batch configurations. So I'm using a pandas data source, and I've configured the data source to have two different assets, one yellow for the yellow cab data, and the other sampled yellow for this data uh, that we just sampled. 
So you'll notice I dropped it in a directory called sampled and I added sampled to the beginning of the name. So that's the only difference here. I've added sampled, sampled. To define an asset, we use a regular expression. So um, I, I can look at the, uh, the file paths here and easily identify their, they've got a year and a month. So we'll create two match groups for the digits of year and month, name them in that way. And that'll make it easy for us to get the data. I'll use the same method that the CLI proposes if you were to write configure uh, or data source new, this test YAML config. And you'll see that I can see these uh, data assets. It's recognizing uh, a number of different batches. Um, and there are some additional files present just because I've downloaded all the taxi data. Uh, but if you were to only grab the yellow cab data, you'll find all the data matches. So let's um, add that data source and create a batch request. Now this batch request um, is important to flag because it's a little bit different than the batch request you'd probably use for just running a standard validation. That's because in my data connector query field here, I'm asking for the previous 12 batches. So basically I'm saying like, look at the last year of data. And that's gonna be what we're gonna feed our assistant. And I'm gonna switch to full on, you know, high risk live demo mode and start typing at this point. So we'll look at my context and context has this new object in it called assistance. So if I say context.assistance, there's a few assistants available or a couple assistants right now. I mentioned onboarding assistant is the one that we're gonna use and I'll run that onboarding assistant. To run an onboarding assistant, you really just need one thing, the batch request. And I'll pass that batch request in. I mentioned this other uh, parameter called estimation. And just to be explicit, I'll pass that in as well. And we'll run with the exact estimation method. And we'll just call the, the output of this exact. So when I run this, what's going to happen is we're going to first iterate over each of the rules that the data assistant knows of. So there's eight different rules we can see. And you'll notice the second, uh, second progress bar here, the, the number of different values that it has has been changing. Uh, that's because each rule is applied only to the columns for which it makes sense. Right? So there was only one rule for which it made sense to apply that last rule, 10 for some of the others. Um, and so it's going through and taking a look at uh, all the, the rules that it has and running through that whole tree, asking all these questions. And now I've got my, uh, my data assistant result. So the first thing I can do is just take a look at the uh, output by what I was showing you earlier, plotting metrics. This is designed to be uh, an interactive experience. So what happens here is I have a dropdown. Um, I can just look at any of the metrics that have been provided. So you know, it looks like there are, uh, in, my, in my data set, you know, between you know, around 300,000 cab rides a month. So multiply that by 10, uh, since I took a 10% sample. And you'd see what we think is probably a pretty good estimate of how many cab rides there are in a month. Um, I can take a look at it. Uh, well, let's look at that quantiles uh, figure because that's the one I mentioned. Um, and I'll, let's pick a different one. Let's pick, uh, uh, let's say, tip amount. So um, here in this tip amount field, you know, I've got again the uh, the twenty fifth, fiftieth, and seventy fifth percentile values over the past year for tip amount. Now. We can keep exploring that, but I want to show you the other estimation method as well. So let's run the same basic idea, but this time we'll call it outliers and we'll write context, assistance, onboarding. And this time we'll ask for it to look at the same data, but we'll say, let's flag outliers. So we'll run this and it's going to go through the same process. It'll take about the same amount of time. Uh, ask the same kind of questions, but this time, instead of just looking at the, uh, the, ex the values that are actually observed, we will, um, we'll, like I said, flag outliers and create parameters or create proposed uh, expectations that um, exclude those outliers. So let's take a look at outliers. And this time, instead of just plotting metrics, I'm going to plot uh, expectations and metrics. So what that's going to do is show the metrics as before, but add those kind of bars, those sort of proposed expectations. And you'll see that in some cases, you know, like it's saying, well, look, let's just say this is the this is the outlier. 
in some cases, um, almost certainly, let's let's take a look at you know like some of these extreme values. I think are often where you'll find uh, problems in in a data quality context. So let's look at like say start with passenger count. Um, we'll see. All right, looks like you know in this case there's a, a, a pretty good range between six and and nine passengers. If I look at the um, the, the the total amount, say uh, of of you know how much does it cost to to ride a cab in New York? Seems like you know usually uh, the the max value is pretty high. You know people are paying more than a thousand dollars for a taxi ride, but it seems likely that something went wrong here. Um, similarly, if I look at uh, trip distance. Um, and uh, and then let's see the uh, tip amount. I can see a case where you know there are some deviations that are uh, you know likely in this case more more likely like the result of legitimate changes, right? And this is kind of that that decision point that I was uh, mentioning where. In some cases, you know, there, it's likely that we see something that's just out of whack. We'll take a look at that again in a second. So now that I've uh, generated these two, uh, or I've run this expectation or the, the data assistant twice, um, I can get the ex uh, expectation suite out of that. So let me first get that exact uh, result. And I'll say get expectation suite. And I'll call that um, taxi onboarding sample. And then actually I'll go ahead and just save that suite. And I'll do the same thing for the outliers. And then we're going to go ahead and build data docs. Um, of course, that's one of the key places that you see a lot of value in great expectations. So let me open up and we can take a look at what we've seen so far. Um, and while we look at that, I also I uh, have prepared a, um, a checkpoint. In this checkpoint, you'll see I'm, I'm going to validate three different uh, three different things. I'm going to validate the um, expectation suite generated by the uh, exact method against the entire data set, the expectation generated by the exact method against just the sample data set, so the same data that we used to, to generate some uh, examples, and then I'm going to um, use the outliers-based expectation suite against the whole data set. So let me go ahead and run that as well. While that's running, let's uh, take a look at these expectation suites. So the um, this, the night the thing the key thing to see here is that we're getting just this very very dense presentation of all of the expectation results that came out of the suite. Um, this is great for scanning, for sharing, for building an initial doc that you would share to someone else, especially, for example, with a subject matter expert who can uh, look at data and just notice things that seem a little bit out of whack. Um, like, for example, I looked at just the last two years of data, so it seems a little bit weird to me that the minimum value in the date column would be 20 years ago, uh, well before New York City started collecting or publishing this data. Um, similarly, when I look at the trip distance value, um, it seems really odd to me that we'd have a max value that is so many times the circumference of the Earth. Um, and wow, that's a long taxi ride. Uh, so I think you know this is a great case where there's almost certainly a additional processing step that we'd want to use if we were going to, for example, build a machine learning model based on this data, because we know that there are data elements in here that will mislead that model and lead us to wrong conclusions. All right, so I ran uh, that checkpoint and um, got great, 
great data back. Let's go ahead and take a look uh, at the validation results. Okay, so I mentioned there were sort of three different configurations in that checkpoint. One of them was the sampled suite against a uh, just sampled batch of data. So you notice against this sampled uh, data. Um, and sort of not surprisingly, this one passed. Um, every expectation that was generated was met because these expectations were just built that way. On the other hand, if I take a look at this outliers data set, um, I'm going to see fail failures. And if I zoom in and just look at those failures, I can immediately see and work through this uh, property that I was describing a bit ago. Now, for example, the number of rows, we expected that to fail. And sure enough, if I you know, multiply these by 10, I find that, yeah, it's filled exactly the way we expected. We sampled data in a statistical way. And sure enough, this next batch of data was right in that expected way. So we could just simply update our, uh, our expectation in that case. In some of the other cases, like these dates that I was mentioning earlier, almost certainly we are finding an important data quality issue that we want to address before we use the data in a dashboard or some other uh, application, because we don't yet trust this data fully. All right, the last thing I want to show you is, um, you know, maybe just a little bit of nerd salad for a second. And that is, I'm going to uh, scroll down past all the information you get from a validation result, plentiferous though it is, and point out that there's also on each of these uh, objects a, um, a way to take a look at all of the results that uh, have been generated. So if we look at the metrics by domain property on any of these results, we'll see all that was collected. So this, is goes, this goes well beyond what we saw either in those charts uh, or even in a suite, which is based on the accumulation of those. Now, what the key thing to observe here is just how much power is available via the rule-based profiler mechanism to continue to build uh, behaviors and assistance that will meet the needs that you have as you're working with your data sets. All right, um, so that's data systems. And uh, again, I couldn't be more excited about being able to get this feature out there, encourage people to use it, see how it can accelerate your ability to work with data. I'm really excited about the whole team that has put this together. And uh, let me actually just stop sharing and uh, see if there are any questions from the group. Well done, James. Uh, yeah, great job. Um, way to get through that that live demo too. That was uh, you actually <laughs> typed in. Nothing bad happened. That was excellent. Uh, cool. Well, while people think about uh, some questions, I could um, ask to my own. Uh, what are some of the main use cases you see for the uh, onboarding assistant? Yeah, that's a great a great question. I, I, obviously, I think, you know, the the thing that the onboarding assistant is really really good at helping you do is accelerate the kind of core benefits that come from using great expectations. So it really help you translate what was tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. Part of the way they do that is just putting the data right in your face, so you can look at something again and just immediately see. Wait a second, two thousand two? Like that's not right. And the reason that that happened is because we had an assistant that was just so greedy in asking all the questions that might be asked and just does it so fast relative to what you would do that you can immediately translate that and say, ah, no, you know, like that is not right. And write your expectation down, capture that knowledge, make it explicit and share it on to someone else from another team. Um, the other part of the answer that I would say to that is just those kind of two big use cases that I mentioned, the, the exact estimation method, which is great if you've got gold standard data. Um, you know, you look at a data set published by the city of New York after they've processed it and you think, ah, gold standard data. And yet, you know, we see in every single time we look at a new batch of data, uh, the same kind of issues that we all see when we're working with data in the wild. Thank you for that. I'm gonna keep going with nobody else. <laughs> nobody else has any questions. Anyone have any questions? 
And feel free to use the hand raise too, if you want. Chat, you can also use the chat. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, how does a data system differ from other automated anomaly detection systems? Yeah, so firstly, data assistants um, are really from the ground up, designed, de designed rather to be focused on ensuring that they're very, very explicit with you about what is happening. So um, in some ways, the uh, you know, for specifically the flag outliers example is performing an anomaly detection. It is literally flagging anomalies from past behavior. But the key thing is that we're keeping you in control from the very beginning. Uh, we're not taking a black box sort of approach to this. And we're making sure that we are taking the, um, the insights that you get both from the process of looking at the data and from knowledge that you had, like not just from looking at the data and putting that into the underlying system. And that last fa fact is like worth repeating, right? An anomaly detection system is by definition looking only at the data that it has going through it. In many real world cases, we're working with data sets that still need cleaning before they're even, frankly, ready hmm. for the kind of anomaly detection that we all really, really want. And great data systems are really, really well suited to that use case. Nice. Uh, hey, James, uh, thank you for presentation. Uh, probably you know about Pandas Profiling Tool, uh, which, yes. uh, which can generate a test for great expectation. Uh, does it mean what uh, data assistant view replace can replace data data pandas profiling uh, and uh, we can use data assistant instead uh, pandas profiling for generate the test well firstly i like i really love uh, pandas profiling and um you know they've done a lot of cool work in fact we've we've worked closely with um uh you know that team over the over the past couple of years so um, I, I would like to say the way I would say it is like, we feel inspired by what they've done and like, yes, have, have kind of taken it, I think a step further. Um, one of the things I really like about Pandas profiling is the way they create a comprehensive visual profile of your data in one page. Um, I think that's a really cool feature. Uh, I do think that especially with the data docs feature that we just showed, uh, we really are kind of, uh, kind of at parity uh, with what you can do with Pandas profiling. Um, but I mean, it's a great question. And, and I think there's going to be continued innovation. One of the things that Pandas Profiling has, has done, I think, is really pushed our thinking around that like whole concept of the semantic types and uh, branching logic. That's something Pandas Profiling did well. And we were pleased to uh, see that kind of moving into Great Expectations core product. Uh, OK, uh, and my second question is, can I uh, customize uh, rules? which data assistants will generate uh, for data profiling. For example, I need to only, I, I need only check my uh, data source for, I don't know, for uh, unique data only, okay? Uh, can I run data assistant say, hey, check only unique uh, values uh, and et cetera? Um, yes. Uh, so, Actually, sorry, what, there's one thing I should mention, by the way. Um, one other key thing um, is that, you know, Pandas profiling, it works with Pandas. Um, and while okay, I did, well, let's, uh, let's, let's, well, let's I did demo pandas. this in Pandas, um, one of the key things that, you know, makes great expectations uh, so powerful is that we work across all the backends. Um, mm -hmm. And da uh, data assistants take advantage of that capability. So all the questions that they're asking, uh, they're asking it in a kind of semantic first way. And then that's getting translated to the execution engine. So one key thing that you can do with data systems is use them across any execution engine. Um, to, to, your, to your other question, um, uh, yes, rules can be customized. Uh, you can customize them by modifying parameters, passing those in. Now, I will say one of the things that um, is on our roadmap to do going forward 
uh, is make it easier for people to contribute and modify data assistance. Like what we really, really would love to see is that we get to kind of parity with the way that you can create custom expectations in terms of making it just that easily, easy and templatized to create new um, assistance. Um, I don't think it's quite you know that easy just yet. Uh, so you know, you know, definitely bear that in mind. But like the case that you described, I just love it, right? Because that's like so much the spirit of what we're trying to do, like right? marry together the knowledge that you already have with this like assistant, right? Who it's very cheap for you to say, hey, go off and like do this research and then come back and and give me a result. Okay, thank you. And yes, and I I want to clarify uh, why I ask about pandas profiling. Uh, because uh, at Provectus, we use a pandas profiling for generate test for how, like uh, initial suite for data. And uh, we, we run pandas profiling, generate test, and add, add this test to, uh, uh, to, to test suite, okay? Uh, and uh, Got it. right now I try to understand, can, should we continue to work with pandas profile or we can use a data assistance and that's all i mean i would definitely encourage you to go ahead and and, and check out data assistance for that use yeah. case and and of course i i i i'm not trying to compare pandas profile and data assistance of course <laughs> okay thank you thanks lexi uh let's see yeah we still have time for more questions anybody else has them I have a couple more. Um, yeah, so James, what do you think is next? What's next for the uh, data assistance project? Well, so I mentioned the the um, case of making it easier to contribute data assistance. Um, but you know, like what I think is really even I would say more exciting are the things that Don mentioned at the very beginning before I even started talking. Um, there's a lot going on in the great expectations ecosystem that's just making it easier for you to get started and engage fully with the product. Data assistance, like I mentioned, they're solving this problem of like, I'm staring at the vastness of the universe. Where do I go? But there are a lot of other problems that we understand people um, face when they're getting started with the data quality project. Like, what, how do I describe my data and access it in different places in different ways? And um, so we're working on those things too. And those are going to be really powerful in making it easier for people to use data assistance. I um, you know, I showed a configuration of a data source and there's a dictionary and, you know, I think it works. It, it, it's, it's, you know, easy to reason about in some ways, but uh, getting that updated with just a couple of lines of code, um, it's just going to be a really powerful thing. So that's, I think the part that I'm like most excited about that's coming next. Very cool. And uh, someone actually just added in the chat uh, about how it'd be nice to marry the Capital One extension um, data assistant uh, package in Greg's expectations. Yes. I, 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 so again, like the thing that gets me the most excited about this kind of capability is that we're helping people to like reason about their data the way that they already think about it and experience it and use it. And like, that's what I really love about the Capital One package is it's, it's like giving you these new richer semantic types. Um, and in their case, they're using, you know, more sophisticated models to identify those types, um, which is a really powerful capability, right? But then by tying that back down to specific expectations, uh, we can keep the connection alive to the very highly explainable core that is what makes Great Expectations stand out as a product. Cool. And I know, I know that group actually is uh, pretty interested in making more uh, data assistance too, which is exciting. So I guess we'll, we'll just have to keep an eye out for that. Yes. Cool. Um, well, I think that's about it for my questions. If anyone has any left or any last words, James? You know, I think what I just want to say, it's like I said at the beginning, is just how excited I am for uh, for the community uh, here, engagement on this kind of capability. I look forward to having you reach out in Slack, uh, say hi to the team. We really are excited to have you use data assistance um, and to hear what kind of, uh, you know, data horror stories slash data insights they help you find right away. Uh, love, I love hearing those stories every time. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning that working with our team to help us understand the specific needs that you have is one of the things that makes this community so great. 
So please, like I said, reach out on Slack, especially at Tal, if you're uh, interested in helping to be a, a user tester and um, inform some of the design of the new capabilities that we've been talking about today. Thank you very, very much. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, please, please be vocal in Slack. Uh, thanks James for the presentation. Uh, yeah, and look forward to hearing some feedback about data assistance. Um, I'll see you all next month. Hi, everybody.